In July of 2016, a security officer saw something he could not explain at Indiana's Mounds State Park. Park Ranger Jim Campbell was on a routine patrol in his truck when he saw a creature around 5.30 in the evening. He had just come around a bend in the road near the public pool, which sits alongside a heavily forested area. The creature in question was about three feet tall at most and appeared to be wearing a hat and drab clothes. Jim said that it was running like the Dickens for the tree line. While the sighting only lasted a few moments, it was clear as day and simply looked like a tiny human being running into the forest. He sensed that it was a male and was trying its best to avoid being seen. Jim had heard the stories that visitors and other park employees had told, and he immediately knew what he had seen, a Pukwudgie. It is especially interesting that so many Pukwudgie sightings take place around Mounds State Park, Indiana. The park gets its name from 10 ceremonial Adena mounds on the property. Earthworks, which were they in Ireland, Scotland, or England, would have been associated with their own little people. However, those familiar with Puck Wudgie lore might find their appearance in the Midwest surprising. Most modern stories of Puck Wudgies place these American fairies in the northeastern United States, particularly in parts of Massachusetts where they are part of the Wampanoag tribal folklore. In reality, the name Puck Wudgie seems to be a relatively new name among indigenous tribes in New England. While the Wampanoag certainly had their own beliefs in little people long before the 19th century, one of the earliest uses of the term Pukwudgie for Northeastern fairies appeared in the 1800s from the pen of American Quaker poet John Greenleaf Whittier. Whittier, a Massachusetts native, was fascinated by little people legends from tribes in the Midwest. It is a curious fact that the Indians had some notion of a race of beings corresponding to the English fairies, he wrote, apparently unaware of similar indigenous beliefs in his own backyard. Winnier mentioned how the Ojibwe people called the fairies Pukwudgies. The term took hold in the Northeast shortly thereafter, cementing in place after Henry Wadsworth Longfellow included the name in his epic poem, The Song of Hiawatha. Both settlers and the Wampanoag alike adopted the term when describing little people in New England. In short, Pukwudgie is unambiguously Midwestern in origin, but nonetheless firmly took hold in a completely different part of America. Why is this important, you ask? Well, the saga of the Pukwudgie name reveals something that fairy folklore does better than any other mythology. It travels and adapts. For the longest time, fairy scholars, yes, there are such people, believed that, by and large, European fairy folklore didn't survive the transatlantic voyage to the New World. It was widely held that belief in fairies died out, with the exception of the shores of eastern Canada and New England. The new fairy stories that did arise in the continental United States appeared to be appropriated from indigenous cultures, elaborated upon with only the slightest old world flavor. This conclusion has met some challenges in recent years. In reality, explicitly European fairy lore appear in North America. We can clearly see the fingerprints of old world fairy belief all throughout the Caribbean, for example and many Scottish settlers imported their ancestral superstitions to the Appalachia, where they blended with the Cherokee little people. Belief in Cornish Tommyknockers appears as far inland as Montana. In the early 1700s, the founder of modern-day Detroit, Michigan, claimed an encounter with a small impish red dwarf he dubbed Le Nain Rouge, obviously an imported Liton, a type of French fairy. Suffice to say... European fairy belief not only survived the voyage across the ocean, but it thrived there, readily taking root among colonial populations in the New World. While many folklorists believe their presence here is just that, folklore, others suspect there is a more objective reality behind fairies in America. European settlers didn't just bring their superstitions, they brought the entities themselves. Okay. Obviously, fairies didn't literally cross the sea on ships, but if belief in them did, then perhaps that is all that is required for them to manifest. 
A surprisingly solid model for this line of thinking can be found in Neil Gaiman's 2001 novel, American Gods, where modern mythologies and the deities they describe are kept alive in the United States simply through the power of belief. Maybe a similar mechanism allows European fairies to appear in modern America. Maybe indigenous little people change their appearance to fit the belief systems brought over by colonists. Either way, to this day, people describe interactions with all manner of fairies, beings which closely correspond to the entities their ancestors once saw across the Atlantic. Much of what follows has been pulled from Simon Young's 2017 Fairy Consensus and represents only a fraction of the sightings that have taken place in recent decades. In the spring of 2000, a 17-year-old girl, let's call her Marjorie, was working at a German-themed Renaissance fair in the Tennessee mountains. She, along with several others, were part of the fairy's fey cast. Marjorie played an elf. During the event, the fey cast would camp on a hill close to where they performed. They nicknamed it Zabarwald, or Enchanted Forest. It was a lovely arrangement, the hill sitting in an open meadow, surrounded by beautiful trees, close enough to work but secluded enough for privacy. Like Vegas, what happens off hours at Renaissance fairs stays off hours at Renaissance fairs. Marjorie was a self-proclaimed pagan, as were several other members of the cast and even the fair's owners. During their free time, they would perform various rituals. It was in the aftermath of one such event that the campers, now chatting casually amongst themselves, gathered around the campfire. After a while, Marjorie and several other cast members her age decided to go on a quick stroll along the edge of the tree line by the hill, which overlooked the fairgrounds. To this day, Marjorie cannot explain what she saw. Just inside the dark tree line, several of us watched a long and winding thick line of small glowing blue lights bobbing and floating along in their course through the woods. They each were anywhere from a few inches off the ground to a couple of feet, and all that could be seen of them were just the glowing blue lights, like a blue LED light. I and about three other people were just standing there outside the tree line, watching this and whispering amongst ourselves as to what these could be. And their course, the line of these lights bent closer to the edge of the tree line. Several of these lights floated out into the clearing to where they were standing. They'd float up to us and then blink out within a couple of feet of us. It wasn't a strict line of them in the trees, but these lights kept together in a rough semblance of a line with some meandering off to the sides here and there. Marjorie immediately thought of old world tales of fairies trooping through the forest, she and her friends called other people to watch, a total of around 20 now witnesses, but all of the adults dismissed the lights as fireflies. Despite this excuse, Marjorie could not shake the feeling that these lights were genuinely strange. Later research confirmed that no species of firefly could account for what she saw. Marjorie also learned that others had seen the lights and connected them to the pagan rituals performed at the fair. There was also another revelation that one of her friends shared the following day. In addition to the blue lights, later that night, as most people were in their tents, he saw a large black humanoid shadow slipping in and out of view around the tents. He said this shadow couldn't have been cast by anyone near the fire due to the distance from the now low burning fire and the angles, plus the tents obscuring the light between the fire and this shadow being. He was cautious of it and I think a little shaken, but claimed that he wasn't afraid. Marjorie continued working at the Renaissance Fair for three more years, though she never saw the lights again. However, she did on one occasion hearing something keeping pace with her during a stroll in the woods around 1.30 in the morning. Is the American God's model of reality accurate? Did pagan rituals at a Renaissance Fair in Tennessee conjure up European fairies? Or did Native American spirits respond to the call? it can prove difficult determining whether or not a modern fairy sighting involves an indigenous entity or one imported from overseas. After all, one of the most impressive things about fairy folklore is how consistent it remains across time and space, with Native American legends sounding remarkably similar to those found in the Old World. One clue, however, might be the manner in which fairies are dressed in these sightings. 
green clothes were quite common among European fairies. An undated encounter collected by investigator and author Janet Board sees a little man in green jump out in front of a truck in Rawson Road in Morongo Valley, California. The driver swerved to avoid the creature, which made a nasty face at him as he came to a halt. The little elf then darted into the truck, making all sorts of racket. The driver grabs his knife, steps out to investigate. Looking under his vehicle, he could see the little imp underneath the radiator, sabotaging the engine. The witness leapt back behind the wheel and took off to a friend's place where the damage was repaired. The following day, several of the missing bolts lay in the middle of the road, right where the encounter took place. Fay folk wearing European clothes appeared to a woman in Missouri late one afternoon in the 1970s. The witness, whom we will call Morgan, had just stepped out of the shower, sat down upon her bed to comb her hair, a towel wrapped around her body. That was when she saw movement by the open window. Looking outside, Morgan saw a parade of tiny men, eight to ten inches tall, crossing a tree branch. Each one would reach the end of the limb, hop to the windowsill, then continue on his merry way in the direction of the water meter alongside the house. Morgan described little gnomes as appearing like tiny German men. They all looked almost the same. I could see ratty hair sticking out from under their hats. They had knobby knees and old-fashioned type hobnail boots on. They looked like little German men. I always thought they had very strange hats on, but I do remember seeing a couple of them with their arms up like they were balancing their hats. I now in hindsight wonder if they were carrying boxes instead. The hats did look like strange boxes. Morgan couldn't wrap her mind around the peculiar visitors and peered closer to convince herself that it was a trick of the light. But nope, sorry ma'am, you've got gnomes. None of them seemed to notice her, at least none that she could remember. When Morgan recorded her story years later, it came with a terrifying postscript. I could still feel the fear of seeing this getting so strong, and then the next thing I know, I'm waking up at the end of my bed with a towel still around me, and it's totally dark outside. What happened here? Remember folks, gnome means no. Another little person with a distinctly European flair appeared to a childhood witness in the 2000s. It greatly resembled your classic garden gnome. While seeing these lawn ornaments has become commonplace today, garden gnomes actually have a long history, arguably dating back into ancient Rome, where statues of minor fertility deities were placed in gardens. These either brought good luck or fended off malevolent forces. Over the years, this concept became associated with various European fairies, from Germanic dwarves and gnomes to Scandinavian figures, just like the Tomte and the Nisse. These beings often represented the ancestral owner of a farmstead who returned after death in the form of a tiny old man to help out with chores and protect families. How appropriate, then, that our story from the 2000s appeared at a family's home. It was early in the morning, and the witness, a young girl, less than 10 years of age, had just accompanied her father and sister to the bottom of their long driveway to wait for the school bus. This particular morning, the bus was running late, and she badly needed to use the bathroom. Deciding that she'd rather miss the bus than suffer an accident, she ran back into the house, leaving her father and sister by the road. As she approached the house, the girl could see that the garage door was still up. She was confused, as she was quite sure that her father had closed it. What's more, something strange seemed to be standing in the center of the garage. She later described what she saw to fairy researchers. I finally made my way up to where I could see, and standing there, I saw what looked like a gnome, she wrote. It looked just like a garden gnome. We didn't own any, with the tall pointy hat, the beard, the boots, the belt. The only things that were different were that the hat was blue, and the gnome was taller than a garden gnome, maybe about the size of a small child. The two simply stared at each other for a few seconds until the gnome weighed at her, Despite this outward kindness, the witness still sensed something sinister about the visitor. Within moments, she was back at the bottom of the driveway, sharing her incredible sighting with her father and sister. Another clue as to a fairy's origin, indigenous or European, might be the witness's heritage. Maybe those of European descent see fairies in a manner befitting their ancestry. 
In August of 1891, journalist William Allen White, whose last name indicates his European heritage, was about to leave his home in El Dorado, Kansas, for a new job in Kansas City. The night before he left, he heard music coming from outside his bedroom window. He could look through the glass and beheld a group of tiny people, each no more than three or four inches tall, dancing beneath an elm tree. He looked away, then looked back, but the vision remained in place before fading eventually. While later remarked, when I recall that hour, I am sure that I was awake, I think. Maybe I'm still crazy. One female witness from California remembered seeing fairies as a child in the 1960s. While wide awake in the middle of the night, she would often watch as several opalescent balls of light, as many as eight, would emerge from the corner of her bedroom, slowly transforming into tiny human shapes. Each was no larger than four or five inches at most, and appeared in the classic Walt Disney fairy shape, inaccurate from a folkloric perspective, but reported nonetheless in modern fairy encounters. Despite being an excitable and fearful child, the witness was never afraid of these beings whenever they appeared. In addition to her bedroom, she would also see these fairies at her grandmother's home. Notably, her grandmother was born in Scotland, begging the question as to whether or not she had passed on psychic sensitivity, known in the old country as the second sight to her granddaughter. One of the most underreported stories involving European fairies in America comes to us from Lake Wales, Florida. This quiet town is home to the humorously named Iron Mountain, one of the highest points in all of Florida, standing at a majestic, whopping 295 feet above sea level. Welcome to Florida. Our people are high, but our mountains are not. Eventually winning a Pulitzer Prize, Bach was enamored with the peace that Iron Mountain embodied and decided to set up a bird sanctuary. Among the many improvements he made, which were lush gardens, reflecting pools, and a 60-bell carillon tower named the Singing Tower. Since February 1st, 1929, the Singing Tower has serenaded Iron Mountain. In the shadow of the tower sat an orange grove, which in 1955 was owned by the aunt of a young girl named Edwina or Edwina. I think it's Edwina Rankin. Edwina would help both her aunt and the other laborers gather oranges in the hot Florida sun. That year, however, the family began to notice that an inordinate amount of oranges seemed to be missing, far beyond what was ever considered normal. While her aunt secretly harbored suspicions that she was being robbed by neighbors or vagabonds, she took the most sensible course of action and called in an exterminator to see if more rats had descended upon the grove than in previous years. The exterminators dutifully set their traps and waited to get a sense for how bad the infestation might be. No one expected that the results would send the community into the Twilight Zone, or more accurately, Gulliver's Travels. When the exterminators had checked the traps, they were shocked to discover that one of them contained a tiny person, less than a foot tall. The being was stark naked. There was no doubt as to whether or not it was an adult, as it sported a full beard and was covered in short hair. Edwina did not see the gnome herself, but her aunt told her that it looked just like how she imagined the Lilliputians from Gulliver's Travels. Despite not understanding the language it spouted at them, everybody could tell it was irate. Edwina's aunt was at a loss regarding what to do next. Her worst fear was that she had cruelly imprisoned a human being maybe a circus performer or something. She decided to set the gnome free. It was a bad choice. Oranges continued to disappear. The exterminators were called in once again, and once again, the little man was captured. This time, however, Edwin's aunt contacted the authorities. Before handing the little man over to the police, she and her aunt placed the being in a ventilated wooden crate meant for oranges. But the police didn't know what to do with it either. They simply filed the report, which still exists, by the way, and can be read today, and drove him away to the station in their squad car. You could say that they unjustly imprisoned him. According to Edwina, the following night was something out of a nightmare. Their house fell under siege by dozens of tiny, hairy, naked men who screamed hideously and lobbed stones at the walls and roof. It was worse than burning, man. At her wit's end, Edwina's aunt felt that their only hope was to re-release the captured gnome once more into the orange grove. 
She dialed law enforcement, who arrived on the scene shortly thereafter. In their hands, they held the orange crate. The officers opened the lid, backed away, and within moments, the little man had hopped out and joined his companions, fleeing off into the darkness. What were they to do? Leaving the problem unaddressed would end in financial ruin. Capturing the creatures would bring physical harm to the family, if not worse. Eventually, one of the workers in the grove stepped forward to offer a possible solution. He was originally from Ireland, he told them, and his fellow workers had experienced similar difficulties with their fairy folk back home. The only way out of this conundrum, he claimed, was to ask one of his contacts back home for a sacred stone, shipped to Florida and blessed by a priest. Only then would the gnomes understand that the orange grove should be left alone. Edwina's family made the proper arrangements, and soon enough the stone arrived. No one was allowed to watch the ceremony that followed, but the family didn't care. All they knew was that the raids on the orange grove ceased shortly afterward. The orange grove was eventually sold to a large farming firm years later, but the stone remains in place. It now sits in an area where the grove's beehives are kept and is strictly off limits. A handful of people who've obtained permission to visit the property claim that the stone is just where it was left all those years ago, to rid the land of the gnomes of Bach Tower. One of the more unsettling stories regarding European fairies is, of course, the legend of the Banshee, whose name literally means fairy woman. All across Ireland, these beings are known to wail hysterically into the night before a death or some other calamity befalls a family member. Similar beings are known to warn of death in Scotland and others in European regions. Since each family was often said to have its own dedicated banshee, it seems only natural that these spirits might have followed settlers to the New World. They may have persisted long after Irish immigrants made landfall in America. One young lady in Michigan may have heard her family's banshee shortly before her grandfather's death, sometime around the year 2000. She had just turned on the television when she heard a horrible atonal moaning or singing from outside the house. It ranged an octave from a low octave moan to a high octave shriek, she said. But it wasn't noise, it was musical. I've lived in rural areas all my life, even spent time in the deep woods. No animal sounds like that. The sound seemed to be taunting her, begging her to look outside, but she resisted the call. I didn't look outside, she said. I didn't want to. Hearing a banshee was bad enough. To see one? No way. Instead, she listened as the voice showcased a vocal range unheard of in human beings, from the lowest bass pitches to the highest shriek of a soprano. I had to drown out the sound with the television, she admitted. It helped, but didn't entirely block it. It was almost as if the sound were in my head, but I was definitely hearing it with my ears. It's hard to explain. The woman's grandfather, who was Irish, was sick with cancer at the time. The witness had a sure sense of what the Banshee's wailing meant. He passed away within days. To this day, however, the thing that sticks with her is how sad the voice seemed. She had always thought of the Banshee as being angry and full of wrath. But this was more like a song of mourning than anything else. It may have had something to do with the fact that, after her grandfather's death, the family name was unlikely to carry on. Another frightening foreign fae female is Jenny Greenteeth. This water hag is known throughout England to wait in the shallows for unsuspecting children or elderly whom she drags to a watery grave. She goes by many regional names, including Peg Powler, Nellie Longarms, or the Grindley Low, but generally seems to be described in similar terms, covered in green, sometimes scaly flesh, with a maw full of sharp teeth and wiry arms tipped with long fingers to snatch her victims. Old Jenny herself might be appearing in America. No, not your ex-girlfriend. If eyewitness stories are to be believed, she has surfaced throughout the eastern United States. For example, a 14-year-old girl in Kentucky was enjoying the outdoors near her home when she took a detour to a local bog. While one side of the wetland was accessible using a paved bike trail, she had decided to use the less defined footpaths to access the opposite side. She never had any clue what lurked beneath the pools. When she reached the opposite side of the bog, she distinctly heard a conversation, despite being completely alone. 
The sound seemed both near and far and was characterized by an unsettling gurgling quality. She stopped to listen. Whatever it was, it didn't seem English. The voice seemed to fade in and out. Curiosity getting the best of her, she set off to find its source. Maybe she was mistaken. Maybe she wasn't alone. Maybe a hunter had come in earlier on a four-wheeler. Maybe not. As she came out of the woods and approached the lip of the bog, the gurgling voice stopped. She later shared her experience with fairy scholar Simon Young. I looked around and could see clear across the muddy water. There was no one on the paved trail as far down the path as I was about to see. No one on any side of the bog. I looked out over the water, listening to the voices fade and twist and change, like they were coming to me on the wind. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement in the water. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. I almost couldn't see it. Even though it was sunny and bright outside, it faded into the water. This weird, muddy blob of a thing with eyes that looked straight through me. It was strange. It was infant-sized. I saw lobs of mud with small, spiny hands and small, shining black eyes. I stared at it for a long time, and then suddenly, it fell away into the water with a huge splash. At the exact same time, about four or five splashes just like that one happened across the entire bog. What was this? Was Jenny Greenteeth or one of her child victims spotted in Kentucky in the 2000s? The girl never found out, but ever since then, an eerie feeling washes over her in the vicinity of that bog, where she still hears inexplicable conversations and voices similar to what she had experienced. Another similar creature appeared in North Carolina within the past decade alone. A woman in her 30s by the pseudonym of Megan was enjoying her book on a large rock by the side of a river while her husband fished downstream. It was early afternoon, and elsewhere in the park there were people walking, including children and dogs. Megan watched as two young boys and their father turned to walk alongside the riverside. As they drew near, she felt a chill and saw something in the current swimming upstream behind them. It was a figure with pale, waterlogged skin. Its face was topped with long black hair and displayed a smile full of jagged teeth. Megan said that this monster paid me no attention but was focused on the boys. They were pointing at it with sticks and could absolutely see it. The dad finally ushered them away from the edge of the river, seemingly unaware of it being feet from his kids. It watched them move up the trail, away with a creepy look on its face, then moved on upriver out of sight. Suffice to say, Megan did not think that the creature had the children's best interest in mind. She believes that she was able to see this horrifying spectacle because her grandmother, who was from Ireland, always told her that she had the sight. Fairy folklore in America continues to blend and adapt in fascinating ways. Surprisingly enough, it actually intersects with the Bigfoot phenomenon in several regards. As just one of the dozens of examples, some contemporary cryptozoologists think that Bigfoot creep into stables at night to braid horses' manes. Regardless of whether or not this is true, it's fascinating to consider that this exact same activity transplanted to 18th century England, Ireland, or Scotland would have been readily blamed on the fairies. Even more compelling are stories of littlefoot creatures, which look almost identical to Bigfoot, yet stand no taller than a child, oftentimes much shorter. Cryptozoologists tend to believe that these are just either juvenile Bigfoot or even a petite Bigfoot subspecies. However, if one looks at descriptions of Scottish brownies, which are household fairies like the Scandinavian tomte we mentioned earlier, one finds numerous allusions to these fairies being short, hairy, and, most importantly, described as resembling monkeys. The same can be said for a number of similar household spirits all throughout Eurasia. Modern fairy sightings, both from the New and Old World, sometimes describe the beings as short and hairy. Remember how the gnomes of Bok Tower were described as being covered in fur, right? These attributes can be found equally often in the lore of several Native American tribes. Two American brownie sightings seem to describe beings which could be easily equated with Littlefoot, if only they appeared in the wilderness. In the 1980s, a landlord was showcasing her Washington state property to a potential new tenant. The renter described several peculiar events in the home, 
including the ghostly apparition of a lady in blue, a fearsome black dog, and chillingly, two hairy hands grasping the metalwork behind an old heating vent. He looked inside, and staring back at him was a small furry man, who disappeared into the vent after noticing that he had been spotted. Another brownie sighting took place in New York State in the 2000s. The witness awoke in his bedroom, only to sense some sort of presence nearby. Looking out his window, he saw a small, maybe eight-inch high being with its back to me, skittering back and forth on the sill. It seemed to be inspecting the tree. It had a simian look about it, stood rather stooped with arms dangling and long wings that appeared to be moving as though triggered by the being's respiration. It had a cap and clothing that looked like dried leaves, and the coloring on the wings looked the same. The witness emphasized several times how much it looked like a monkey. He had ample time, several minutes, to watch the creature before it took off into the sky. The fairy folklore blends with other paranormal phenomena as well, including ghosts. However, it seems to resemble UFO activity the strongest. Both fairies and aliens are fond of kidnapping children, leave those who encounter them with missing time, and are associated with anomalous light phenomena. Just to name a few correspondences, some fairies, seen both in centuries past and today, even exhibit the oversized heads and eyes so often reported by alien abductees. The idea that UFO phenomena and fairies might share a common source has been championed over the years by a variety of authors, including but not limited to Jacques Vallée, Whitley Strieber, and Eddie Bullard, and most recently, Josh Kutchen. Anyone looking for an exhaustive list of similarities should consult their work, particularly Jacques Vallée's 1969 masterwork, Passport to Magonia. For the rest of us, a few choice stories drive home how closely these two contact modalities resemble one another. For example, one witness in the 1960s claimed to have wandered into a California forest, only to find herself facing down a number of fairies and elves playing at the edge of a meadow, including a fairy queen. The messages that the witness received wouldn't be out of place in UFO contactee literature of the era or even in some modern alien abductions as chronicled by late researcher John Mack. According to the witness, she was told, Love shall overcome, so rejoice. The secret of the age is that the universe, the omniverse, she, the divine impulse, mother of all is pure joy, everything is joy, the source, the end, joy. In previous episodes, I've mentioned the Nunahi, a type of Cherokee spirit closely resembling European fairies. One legend sounds uncannily like it, involving a flying saucer. In this story, the Nunahi sent an envoy to tell the Cherokee villagers that in seven days' time, they would be relocating one of their townhouses, which were often, but not always, earthworks, like burial mounds. Their task would only succeed if everyone in the village remained silent. When the appointed time came, however, the Cherokee heard what sounded like peals of thunder steadily approaching their community. Once the ground began shaking, many of the villagers could not help themselves and cried out in terror. The thunderous sounds were those of the Nunahi, relocating their immense round home through the air. However, the shrieks from the Cherokee startled the Nunahi, and they lost their grip. Part of the townhouse fell to the earth, where it became the mound at a nearby village known as Setsi. The remainder of their dwelling made it to a nearby mountain called Lone Peak, where it turned into solid rock. And to this day, both the Nunahi and the Cherokee they invited along dwell, invisibly, inside the rock. Stories of European fairies appearing in America illustrate just how vibrant and alive fairy folklore remains. It seems capable of adapting alongside our culture, changing as our expectations shift. Where we once feared fairies at the bottom of the garden, we now cast our eyes to the skies. Where we once looked for little men in green, we now look for little green men. Yet, as fluid as the phenomenon appears to be, it also maintains a shocking level of consistency across time and space, presenting the same motifs in both the old and new worlds. This consistency implies a certain objectivity behind fairy sightings. It is likely they will continue to adapt as we head into our uncertain future. But more importantly, 
I want to know what you guys think. Just how much truth is there to this entire fairy folklore thing? Or is it just old legends that keep popping up time and time again because people can't let them go? I want to hear your thoughts, so you tell me what you think. And if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll check you guys out in the very next episode.